For over 10 years, we at Climate One have been engaging policymakers, influencers, entrepreneurs, and activists and scientists in broad, respectful, candid conversations about everything climate. Food, energy, water, technology, transportation, housing. We've had huge success bringing together people who think they're on opposite sides of issues. When they sit down and have a candid conversation, they often find common ground and the basis for real solutions. We're emotional beings. Thoughtful, inclusive conversations create the conditions in which the changes we want to see become possible. So I want to hear from you. When you talk about climate, how do you talk about it? More importantly, what do you want to be talking about? With whom? Join the conversation. Even make your own video. Invite your friends to join you. Let's talk climate. this live stream discussion of food and agriculture in the era of coronavirus and climate disruption. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and before we talk about growing food in California and around the country, I'd like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Miwok people who stewarded these lands for 10,000 years. We'd love to hear from you today, so please share your questions in the live stream, uh, comment section of the live stream, or you can tweet them at us using our handle at Climate One. For future Climate One discussions on coronavirus, economic disruption, human behavior, and all things climate, you can sign up for our newsletter at climateone.org. You can also subscribe to our podcast that drops every Friday and is available wherever you get your pods. Coronavirus is affecting every aspect of our lives and economy, perhaps none more than our food system. Restaurants are devastated. Workers have either lost their job or taken, take great risks going to their job or jobs if they're fortunate enough to still be employed. Going to the grocery store is now a highly planned venture into risky territory. What other impact is COVID-19 having on the way food is produced and consumed? How is the pandemic affecting efforts to address agriculture's contribution to climate disruption. I'm delighted to welcome our fabulous guest today. Lisa Held is a senior reporter with Civil Eats who covers the meat industry and other aspects of agriculture. Karen Ross is secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture and former chief of staff at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And Helene York is professor of food and business at the Food and Business School of the Culinary Institute of America and a former executive with companies providing food for corporations and universities around the country and around the world. Welcome to you all. I want to begin by going out to a farm. Shay Myers calls himself a third generation farm kid. His company, Hawaii Produce, grows onions and other crops on the Oregon Idaho border. And like thousands of farmers, he was caught off guard, caught off guard by the drastic effects of the COVID-19 had on his business. Climate One's Andrew Stelzer asked Myers to talk about what he's been through and how he's trying to adjust his business model for this new reality. As 2020 began, business was good at Oahe. Over the past few years, their customer base had been growing. And with 1,200 acres of onions, Shea Myers says everything was running pretty smoothly. In February and really in March is when we started to fill it. With uh, COVID, the impact for us was initially a whole bunch of purchasing. A lot of people went to the grocery store and they wanted to stock up and an onion is one of those things that's not going to go bad like a banana in three or four days. And so in lieu of buying bananas, people were buying things like onions and potatoes and carrots and, you know, some of these hearty vegetables. And initially we saw a spike, 40% probably um, increase in total sales. Even though we lost 80% of our food service business, the retail side just picked up significantly. So our the month of March was very, very heavy sales, followed by some of the lowest sales that we've ever seen. I mean, like an 80% swing. We were only selling 20% of our normal volume. It would have to be mid-March, mid to late March, when we finally decided that we were not going to have a home for some of our onions. We basically dug compost pits, you know, brought an excavator in and started dumping those onions. The initial grocery store run on onions had faded, and restaurants all across the country, the main market for onions, were shutting their doors. Myers had to dump about 6 million pounds of onions, costing his operation about $800,000. Lucky for him, his other crops, like asparagus and sweet potatoes, don't rely on the restaurant business, and retail sales of those veggies hasn't taken much of a hit. Selling small, direct-to-consumers has actually thrived in the COVID era. 
Meyer says he and other area farms have been scrambling to adjust. The Farmers to Families Food Box Program by the USDA. I will say that program has worked and that has gotten dollars to the farmers and supported, bolstered the market in a way that I didn't think that it would. And I also think there's some significant ramifications that are positive. How many people are now getting fresh produce at home that really never got it there before and weren't eating it before and didn't know how to cook with it before? There were a lot of my competitors here that sold only to restaurants or in a roundabout way, they sold to distributors that sold to restaurants or only sold to processors. Those are the two places that were most significantly impacted and therefore they had the most product that had to be disposed of. We have all diversified in the way that we pack. So the difference is a typical onion is sold in a 50 pound bag, believe it or not. The other way to sell and the way that the consumption switched was to two, three and five pound bags of onions. So that's what a lot of uh, folks have done in the Idaho, Oregon growing region is install equipment to be able to pack that way. We grow in or Idaho and Oregon and in California and our California operation, we were planning on doing zero three pound bags, no consumer bags, none of that. We were only going to supply our food service customers when we went there just for simplicity. We're just starting and we ended up taking all of our equipment from Idaho, moving it to California and installing it there to be able to do those two, three and five pound bags. Looking ahead, Meyer says his big worry is next season. Despite an uncertain future, he had to plant his next crop of onions back in April. We look at restaurants and the closure rate. Some estimates are putting the closures of restaurants at 50%. Are we simply all going to visit the remaining restaurants more and therefore consumption the same? Or will we visit those restaurants the same as we always did and consumption will then be reduced? And it's going to take probably two years, I would argue, from the time that this uh, pandemic began before those numbers have resettled and the dust is settled and we can try and improve our practices. That was Shay Myers of Hawaii Produce on the Oregon and Idaho border. Karen Ross, a lot in there, just, you know, gut-wrenching, dumping six million pounds of onions, uh, a lot of, you know, waste. Tell us the stories you see. It Go back to that early March. There's a lot in there. I'd like sure. to get your response to that. Sure. So the abruptness, you know, to shut down the economy, that abruptness is what really caused this distribution channel um, challenge that we had. And Shay talked on several things. One is that with food service, few people realize that today, slightly more than 50% of our food dollars is spent off out of the home. So it's at school cafeterias, campuses, conventions, hotels, and restaurants. And so when you think about 50% of the market immediately being shut down, that's a huge thing to try to absorb. And what he talked about is what we saw here in California. Um, if the product was one that could be repackaged, it was, but that requires equipment and people and training. If your whole business model is around the retail sales, you don't necessarily have people who could sell to food service and vice versa, going from food service to immediately going into that retail type of setting. So that's what we saw in some of the instances of some of the food is that it was just trying to adjust as rapidly as we possibly can and trying to figure out, is this going to be worth it? Like they made a determination fairly early. It's worth it for us to bring the equipment from Idaho to California. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a dairy line, when all you're doing is packaging, one whole line is that packaging for school food lunches. And you don't know if those kids are still going to be able to get those lunches. Immediately, we didn't know if we were going to be able to distribute that. Those were the things that caused the disruptions, that caused those issues of having to plow under, turn into compost, or dump milk. We had one weekend in California where there was actually milk that had to be dumped, but it was also coming at the time of the year when the cows were most productive. So we always have surplus milk anyway. So that was part of that disruption, but people quickly pivoted so we didn't have to continue that. And because we had an existing program and partnership with our California Association of Food Banks, we have a long-standing program, more than 15 years old, of farmers being able to call up the food bank and saying, I've got product and we've been able to do fresh produce in our food boxes in California over this long period of time. And when we have surplus, 
we've been able to send it through partners with Feeding America to get California produce to other places. So having the USDA program come in has been a wonderful thing because they're buying it at a market price where our state program is just helping to pay for the harvest. So we're, we're seeing that between the two programs, we've really been able to address the food waste issue in particular. I do have to say that the early calculations for financial losses to farmers are minimum of $2 billion. Um, and the, the total estimation could go as high as $8 billion for just the financial losses that have been absorbed. Thank you. Uh, Helene, your, your phone started ringing in March. Uh, people were calling you when this started to, the COVID crisis really started to unfold. Uh, who called you and what did they want? Well, uh, I worked at the time with a national uh, contract food services company. That's the other half that Karen was referring to. We run the restaurants at corporations, um, others in the field at colleges, um, museums, and so forth. And um, what that means is we are providing food for employees of those companies. It is a really, really large sector of the restaurant industry. And uh, when we shut down 100 restaurants over the course of 10 days, um, which was enormous and more came. And um, so, we had built over a 20-year period relationship with some of the smaller farmers and their cooperatives, um, especially in Northern California and Southern California. And they had become dependent, maybe. Or another way of saying is they had a very good relationship with the chefs at our uh, restaurants that bought their produce. And this was March when the harvests were just beginning. I mean, the crops that were planted in January were just available and they were just about to sell. They had gone through sort of a two, three month period where they hadn't been selling that much because of the cold weather. They were gonna make their spring harvest dollars and all of a sudden we were shut down. And so we uh, tried to work with uh, Feeding America, with Project Open Hand, um, with Chefs to Un End Hunger, uh, where we have a, a partnership really for prepared food. Um, so at the end of a, a lunch service, there's always some food left over. And so we want, we, um, we donate it to uh, places that serve prepared food. But honestly, we couldn't satisfy the demand of the local farmers the way we could when the restaurants were open. We didn't have an unlimited supply of money to just buy things yeah. and donate them. And so we encouraged uh, a number of our managers who were still employed by our generous clients to set up community supported agriculture boxes. And that was a way to support the farmers, but they all had to pivot they had to go from packing those 50 pounds of product that they would send to a contract restaurant or an independent restaurant, and now they had to put them in boxes. And you can't give local people a box of 10 pounds of onions. They can't afford it, they can't store it. You know, you have to then build a whole new process as some of these farmers did. And I applaud them, but it was tough going for a long time. Lisa Held, you've written about uh, the local food revolution moved online and, and uh, how some small farms adapted and pivoted online as well as the food hubs that did a good job. Tell us about that reporting you did. Sure, so I, I think uh, you know, we've been reporting on how COVID-19 has affected the food system at Civili since the beginning and everything that Karen and Helene just said and everything Shay expressed really, you know, we've been talking to farmers all over the country who have had similar experiences. And um, in terms of these small uh, farms that sell into local and regional markets, they, it depends on where you are in the country and what you sell and a million factors. Yeah. There's, there's certainly a lot of diversity, but one thing we definitely were seeing um, across the country is that farmers saw a lot of increased demand from, from uh, consumers who are home and wanted food at home um, direct to consumer. 
But the problem is, you know, you can't just pick up and bring them. <laughs> you need a, a, a marketing channel. So a lot of, and, and actually depending on where you were in the country, farmer's markets, some of them shut down. Some of them stayed open and, um, you know, farmers were packaging things differently and doing no contact pickups. And, but it, it really just depended on where, where you are in the country. So a lot of farmers went totally online, which was, ve it's very effective, but requires extra labor, extra, you know, packaging. So just so much time, essentially creating a whole new business model um, at the time when you're transitioning into harvest season. So it was just a lot of um, adjusting and, and pivoting. And um, <laughs> I mean, surprisingly, so many of these farms, though, got their, their CSAs online and, you know, had 300 person wait lists and are, you know, fulfilling all these online orders, um, doing at home deliveries, doing uh, pickup sites and, and really it, it, in some ways, it seems like getting more of this local food to more families than they were before. Helene York, um, you said that some of the waste happened early and that didn't have to happen or it could have been different if the federal government had a different response. Well, it is well known that there was a uh, plan that the administration could have used to react to COVID um, that the administration didn't use. Um, and uh, certainly um, we all know some very good public servants in the USDA um, and many of them had their hands tied. Um, uh, there could have been a lot more support for uh, uh, farmers of all different sizes uh, to really uh, pivot, help them pivot sooner and also to store a lot of their, whether it's grains or crops, um, store things in cold storage or frozen storage. There, was, there wasn't the coordinated effort. While I agree with Shay that uh, the program that he has uh, been a part of has been uh, a godsend to a lot of uh, producers as well as a lot of consumers, uh, there could have been a 10 time uh, improvement uh, uh, effort um, on how we support eaters as well as producers that could have come from more focused planning from the USDA. Could I add something to that very quickly? Sure. And also that program was rolled out with very little coordination with actual food banks who know their areas, they know the capacity of the pantries they're shipping to, they have the storage to make sure that they're not being overloaded. So that lack of connecting with the food banks who have become the new distribution channel was a missing element in those early, early days. And Karen Roth is someone who used to be chief of staff at the USDA. You know, we've heard a lot about the, the CDC and, and other FDA. We haven't, I haven't mm -hmm. heard as much about the U.S. Department of mm -hmm. Agriculture. Um, what grade would you give it in terms of the, you know, its overall national response to COVID supporting farmers and our well, food <laughs> I want to be kind because we've never had to do COVID and stand up programs as quickly as we did. Um, but I, I would give them um, probably a B for effort. Um, and a C for implementation. Um, I have found that on a lot of the SNAP waivers, school program waivers, even our specialty crop block grant where we are able to divert $2 million to the food banks, the, every waiver they could do, they did. But again, extending some of those waivers is now becoming a challenge because of direction that's coming from above USDA, in my yes. opinion. If you're just joining us, we're talking about COVID and the American food system. Uh, with Climate One, I'm Greg Dalton. My guests are Karen Ross, Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, Lisa Held, Senior Reporter with Civil Eats, and Helene York is a professor of the Food and Business School at the Culinary Institute mm -hmm. of America. Consumers often think about the impact of food on their body and the environment, but workers are often overlooked. We want to give them a voice in this conversation. So I talked with Gabriel Morales with Brand Workers, an organization in New York City focused on empowering workers in the local, organic, and specialty food industry. Gabriel Morales, Gabriel Morales, Morales, welcome to Climate One. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. So when we think about vulnerable workers in the American food system, 
We often think about workers at a pork processing plant where there's thousands of hogs and hundreds of workers. Um, tell us about other areas where there are vulnerable workers in the, uh, this COVID era that may be different than what most people think about. Yeah, definitely. You know, my organization, Brand Workers, we organize in specialty food manufacturing or local food manufacturing, um, that niche of um, custom, the customer base that specifically wants local, organic, sustainable uh, food. And so the workers that we're organizing with, organizing alongside, are making the making the hummus, making the dumplings, making the tortillas, making the spices. They're making all of these really local uh, food stuff for the New York City community. Uh, very specifically, the organizers that we, uh, the workers that we're organizing alongside uh, are artisanal bread makers. And so that's a a group of workers that is hardly ever talked about. Uh, but these are these are workers that are, you know, waking up 5 a.m. or even earlier. They're they're at the factory at 5 a.m. It's an industry that's largely worked by black and brown uh immigrant workers of of color. There, there's about 55,000 food manufacturing workers in New York City right now. We're talking about 70, 80, 85% layoffs in some of these factories. And so the pandemic has been devastating to workers. Um, and I think that the main problem that we're seeing is that this really isn't the first emergency that these immigrant workers have been fighting. Like workers have for years been fighting systematic, systemic inequality through lower wages, through outright wage theft. In, at Brand Workers, we've seen just the huge amounts of outright wage theft. Uh, they, they face higher rates of injury. They face more reported instances of sexual discrimination and sexual harass, ha, harassment. Uh, and the devastating effects of U.S. immigration policy. Uh, which under the Trump administration has worked diligently to break up families and break up immigrant communities. And so the coronavirus has really magnified those problems. And the results have been absolutely devastating to immigrant communities. And those workers are excluded. They were excluded from... Um, the stimulus package from earlier in the year. And so we've had to come together as um, a immigrant rights community across New York City and across the country to fight for policies that help bring those workers into some, to give those workers the, some of the help that they desperately need. Are there examples of companies that have risen to the moment that have done the things you've, you're asking for, you know, four weeks of paid sick leave, you know, pandemic pay or hazard premium, uh, protection from retaliation against workers who raise health concerns? Are there, are there some examples of companies that have really risen to the moment? In, in my experience and the, and the experience of workers that are talking to us, there, there aren't companies that have risen to the moment. There are companies that have risen to essentially a bare minimum. Um, but in terms of like what brand workers is actually looking for, uh, for work workers, which is being able to have the power to, to have a voice on their own job and to talk about the things that they want. N no, no companies have risen to this moment. We want for people to know what it is that you can do both to plan before and after campaigning that workers can do both before and after an emergency hits like people need support for mental health and trauma people need um to understand like what are how to build infrastructure in immigrant communities and then importantly how do you help communities raise funds to to help mitigate some of the worst uh, outcomes of people being unemployed for who knows how long people are going to be unemployed. And so we, we want to help organizations do that work. Uh, and, and so we are helping to train organizations, 
and to train individual community members to prepare themselves for emergencies like COVID-19. Gabriel Morales with Brand Workers, thanks for sharing your insights on Climate One. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. Karen Ross, a lot in there yeah. about you know workers. You know, obviously that's one region, one one right. part of the worker food chain. Right. But we have an American food system that's you know built on low cost, low price, and that really is kind of in some ways you know on, on the backs of workers that aren't paid very much. Your thoughts on what you heard? Yeah, so efficiency and just in time delivery is really driving a lot of what the current system is about. Um, and it's taken a while to really raise these kinds of equity issues, but now they are front and center. And this is something that I think will stay with us beyond this and the adjustments that we make coming out of this will be for the better. Um, Obviously, the the day from day one, the concern about our essential workforce, because agriculture is part of the critical infrastructure, um, there were things to work through, like just the list of which which jobs are all jobs, you know, essential. And then the conflicting messaging that were coming out, like the Bay Area was the first one to do such a complete shutdown. Well, we had workers who were going to dairy processing plants or food processing plants, driving from Tracy, going into the Bay Area, that were being stopped. And you can imagine you're going into the swing shift or the late night shift at one of those lines, and you get stopped by local law enforcement, and you don't know what you're being stopped for. That's a heart-chilling um, experience, and then that creates the fear factor throughout the community. So it took, you know, a good week to 10 days to make sure we had everybody equipped with cards to say, I'm going to my job at X, I'm essential worker, just ironing out those kinds of things. But then we knew that, how, like, with if this continues, and that was before we really saw the seriousness of this and the challenges of finding cures and treatments, that, that's trying to think ahead about when we get the surge of seasonal work that has to happen, where farm workers will be moving around more. And when we started to talk about reopening the economy, the concern about they're not just coming to work, where you know, people are going to feel that sense of freedom. How do we keep everybody safe so that we don't have a cycle that we're seeing right now? You're coming into work and are you being exposed there and taking it home where you might be in a congested um, house situation, or your culture is that you have multi generations living in the same household. How do we prevent it either coming into the workplace or from the workplace going home and the broader community spread? And our rural communities, we're about family. We have social gatherings, we have birthday parties, we have Sunday afternoon barbecues. And how do you tell people family is everything? love them from a distance. And that's, you know, some of that messaging just has not been complete, or it hasn't been culturally appropriate, and really sensitive to the norms of how we live and work in rural communities. Those are still lingering issues. And that's part of the strike force that the governor announced this week for the Central Valley. We have high numbers in the Central Valley. It's coinciding with big harvest and big cultivation activities, and uh, opening up of food processing plants. So we're going to be partnering and in the valley in a very strong way to see what we can do to rebend the curve back down to where it needs to be. Lisa Hills, I'd like to hear from your reporting on on reporter on on farm workers and some of the big questions now is that the the, the you know the the big meat packing uh, story seems to have been stabilized. What are some of the big questions now regarding protecting the workers who provide our food to us? Yeah, I, I mean, I think. You know, Gabriel said something that that really stuck with me, which is, you know, these issues were already there and the pandemic really shed light on them, which, you know, exploitative practices um, with regards to workers, especially in meatpacking plants have been around for a long time. And, um, you know, we our reporting has really showed how some of that is is causing these outbreaks to be much worse than they need to be. And companies have been really slow to react. So. You know, for example, um, fast, really fast line speeds in meatpacking plants that are dangerous for workers in other ways also mean that thousands of employees are crowded together and cannot possibly socially distance. Um, and, you know, low wages, lack of benefits, as cases were increasing, instead of guaranteeing paid sick leave, companies were offering bonuses to employees uh, to not miss a day of work, which obviously provides an incentive for them to come in sick, especially when you don't have um, an income that can support you. Um, and, you know, it, 
it was clear very quickly that big companies like Tyson and Smithfield and JBS were not doing a lot to institute protective measures until after major outbreaks had occurred. And, you know, there was that period, I, I want to say it was like April, May, where a lot of meatpacking plants were shutting down and there were all these hogs that had nowhere to go. And, and it felt like this real breakdown. And, and like you said, it does feel like that has stabilized, but I, I want to be clear that um, people are still getting sick. And, you know, the, the latest numbers from the Food and Environment Reporting Network um, on meatpacking workers, uh, 38,000 cases estimated and 171 deaths um, around the country. And those numbers are, are still increasing. And one thing I wanted to talk about is um, we talked about the USDA earlier, and uh, I reported a story on a different agency, OSHA. And um, they're the federal agency tasked with protecting workers on the job. And um, this was in mid-June, but uh, not much has changed. You know, they've issued voluntary guidance for employers and, and in response to worker complaints about not, not being provided with PPE, not uh, being able to socially distance. Um, in the majority of cases, the agency is just advising businesses of that guidance rather than doing on-site inspections. Um, and, you know, when I did my story, they had issued one citation in response to more than 5,000 complaints, and they just released numbers uh, last week that they've now issued four citations in response to almost 8,000 complaints. So that's a lot of um, worker complaints that are coming in and very little um, action in terms of what's being done to protect these workers. Helene York, you've actually toured meat processing plants, so a lot of people can't get into them. They're, they're shrouded in secrecy, but you've done that as part of your job doing due diligence for the supply chains for corporations and college campuses. Take us inside. What are these processes, meat packing plants like, and what do you think is some of the production slowing down the line, et cetera, some of the accommodations for workers? Well, yeah, I've been to more uh, meat processing plants than I care to admit. Um, I don't even eat meat, but uh, I have I have looked at them uh, in many different states in the United States and several countries outside the U.S. And there are some real commonalities. Um, uh, you know, immigrants wherever um, the uh, the facility is located. If it's in the United States, they're mostly Mexican, some from Central America, different parts of the country, African-American, not immigrants, but underrepresented minorities. When you go to other places around the world, it's also immigrants. It is a uh, industry um, that doesn't pay people well, um, and that really takes people with very limited language skills um, and uh, packs them together like they pack the animals together. Um, I can say there have been some very good things that have surprised me at a lot of these facilities, um, but they, they are more about the health of the animals than they are about the health of uh, the people who are working there. Um, in order to, I was in North Carolina a couple of years ago, and in order to see a hog plant, I had to take a shower. I had to leave all my clothes behind. They gave me clothes. They gave me full like spacesuits. I mean, it was way beyond PPE. And um, I had to uh, be so protected because they were afraid that I might um, give an illness to an animal. Um, the uh, workers, um, and this has been true in all the plants that I've seen, often wear basic PPE, but they're very close to each other, and, um, and they have to work fast. They're not interacting much on the line. Um, but uh, what I think is missed by accounts about how these plants work is all of the people stuff. So you can stand next to each other, you can work quickly, you're basically in a huge refrigerator, right? It's 38 degrees typically uh, when an animal's been slaughtered and then you have to cut it up because you have to maintain the safety of the meat supply. But then workers have breaks and um, they have lunch and they put their personal items in lockers 
that are like high school, only smaller, right? They're tiny little lockers for a lunchbox. And so even if you accept what the companies are saying, that we're giving PPE to workers and we're slowing down the lines, and we may even put some plexiglass between workers, what are they doing to help the workers when they take a break, when they have lunch, when they go home? I don't see it. I, I, have, I have seen people interact. It's the only time of the day when they can interact with other human beings because they can't pay attention to other humans when they're quickly processing chicken or pork or anything else. We have a question from YouTube. Rebecca asks, uh, what are some things we as consumers can do in order to support the uh, workers' rights, to support the rights of workers in our food system? Um, Lisa Held? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I think educating yourself on, on what's happening um, in the food system and where you get your food and how, how the company that uh, makes that food is treating its workers um, is definitely the first step. Uh, you can, you know, there, there's kind of, there are policy fixes to some of the things we're talking about. And then there's the kind of vote with your dollars approach. And some people lean more heavily on one side or the other, but both um, can can make a difference. So, you know, um, you can get engaged with policies that, that um, you know, for instance, guarantee paid sick leave for workers and, and voice your, call your senators and tell them that you believe workers deserve that. Um, or on the, the side of voting with your, with your dollars, really, you know, looking into these issues and seeing which companies are addressing um, worker protections and choosing to buy from them. We're talking, if you're just joining us, we're talking about COVID and climate and the food system at Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, my guests are Lisa Held, senior reporter with Civil Eats, Karen Ross, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and Helene York, professor at the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, so let's go to our lightning round. We have a number of quick questions for you to change up the pace here. Um, yeah, these are some straight on questions, uh, beginning with Helene York. Um, amount of uh, general amount, if, have you gained or lost weight hunkering down during COVID, depending on, yeah. I have lost weight. I, instead of commuting, I walk. Wow, I, I hear so many people who've gained myself, uh, gained in others. Most people are <laughs> that I hear are gaining weight. Um, uh, Lisa Held, number of plastic bags you have carried out of a grocery store in the last couple of weeks? Uh, zero. <laughs> Great, congratulations. Karen Ross, number of plastic forks you have used in the last couple of weeks? I don't use that. Zero. Wow. Um, Helene York, your favorite fruit? Tomato, especially now. Uh, Karen Ross, your favorite vegetable? Whoa. Well, asparagus. I love asparagus. I know that's asking you like to pick your paper. I know. I, I, I uh, don't have any paper children. So hard. <laughs> uh, Lisa Held, your favorite food writer? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not going to choose myself. Um, I'll say someone I'm really enjoying right now, um, Alicia Kennedy. She's incredible. Uh, Karen Ross, the least favorite meal made in your home when you were growing up? Now, I'm from a farm in western Nebraska, so overcooked broccoli still haunts me to this day. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa held your favorite dish made in your home growing up. Uh, chicken Parmesan. Mm. Helene York, a food that you think should get more respect in America's kitchens. Anchovies, hands down. Mm. Uh, this is association. I'll mention it, something and the first thing that comes to your mind, one word or phrase off the top of your mind with reckless abandon, unfiltered. Uh, Karen Ross, what comes to mind when I mention Co Senator Cory Booker's bill proposing an 18-month moratorium on large agricultural mergers? I think it has a hard road to hoe. I, si size contributes to efficiency, and those are the trade-offs we have to make for affordability. Just got to say it. Sorry. <laughs> 
Uh, Lisa Held, what comes to mind when I mention services that deliver meal kits to home, home such as Blue Apron? Wasteful. <laughs> I subscribed to one once and the waste was horrifying. Um, Helene York, what comes to mind, top of mind when I say organic food? Affluent food. Affluent food? It's, it's, it's very expensive and there are a lot of producers who really support regenerative agriculture and biodiversity in the, soil, uh, in the soil who refuse to be a part of the organic system. Uh, this is a true or false, one for each of you. Uh, true or false, Karen Ross, American consumers deserve to have more visibility into where their meat is processed. True, True one word, right? <laughs> uh, Helene York, uh, true or false, Google and other tech giants have a disturbing amount of power over our lives and economy. Uh, not when it comes to their food programs, that's a good influence. We'll come back to that. Uh, last one, uh, true or false, uh, Lisa held, GMOs are safe for humans to eat. True, but I don't think that's the issue. Ah, okay, great. You're right. I'm getting through the, uh, the, uh, the, the lightning round. Was, there's power uh, concentration, et cetera. Um, I do want to talk about you know, the climate aspect of this, which we haven't gotten to a lot yet in this conversation. This is climate one. Um, you know, uh, and as Lisa uh, re uh, reported recently on a story that the head of uh, commodities at Goldman Sachs, Jeff Curry, said that, uh, you know, the only commodity looking as precarious as oil was livestock. Tyson stock was 80 before COVID. It tickled 50 and now it's around 60. It's down 30 percent on this year compared to the S&P is about flat, which raises questions about livestock. You know, Helene York, do you think people are giving plant based burgers more of a look these days? You know, could there be some shift away from meat, which we know is a big contr contribution to greenhouse gases? Oh, we know that people are really looking at plant-based meat and also uh, cell-based meat um, and hybrids. And I think all of them are in early stages. Um, there's still venture capital money backing them. Um, I think they all deserve a chance. Um, there was a report that was just uh, published within the last few days um, looking at the number of uh, uh, Americans who had eaten uh, one of these alternatives for the first time uh, over the past uh, four months. And it's, it's shot up, as you can see from the sales. And most people are saying that they'll have it again. Uh, they'll have it again because they like the taste, uh, because uh, they like the texture, and most importantly, because they feel that it's healthier for them. And the climate argument is general in food is generally one with the health promotion uh, because that's where most consumers are. And um, it's convenient for those of us who wanna promote uh, plant-based foods, whether it's vegetables or other uh, alternatives because most people are thinking about health and um, climate friendly eating is healthier eating. Karen Ross, your thoughts on a shift toward more of a plant-based diet. We know that methane is a big uh, climate uh, kill eating gas from, from cows, big uh, climate imp input, um, big climate footprint from dairy and, and meat processing. Could we go, be going more toward a less meat, more climate friendly diet in this COVID context? So um, I think that we need to be very careful here because of early studies that have been refuted by UC Davis and Dr. Frank Metliner provides very good factual information to help people understand the actuality of that. We also have to understand that we cannot turn all of the land that's now in rangeland grazing into cropland because it's not suitable for crops. It was it's suitable for, for animals on the land animals on the land working nutrients back into the ground are part of regenerative agriculture. But do we need to 
mix up our diets with more plant-based? Yes. We see where the growth is happening, especially is in um, what have been emerging economies, but now with COVID, they're being set back. People want more protein as part of a balanced diet to help themselves. And so we can't ignore that fact. We can't ignore that fact of all the herdsmen in Africa who make their living from, from cattle. It's how we manage the land and manage the numbers to do more rotational grazing so that we can have a healthy ecosystem and part of a healthy diet. But we cannot all consume at the rate of meat consumption that we have been. That's not sustainable. And I think that we, we need alternatives to be able to sustain the world's population with the population growth that we are experiencing and will continue to experience. But Secretary Ross, are you saying that the climate impacts of meat and dairy are overstated or exaggerated? The FAO study, what, that's what Dr. Frank Mitliner was made chair of the, of the committee that, that helped pinpoint those numbers. And I think it's really important. We get locked into certain studies and we never look at the additional science that comes out. In California, agriculture is 8% of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Of that, methane is 2% of that. And dairy is being held right now in California to reducing their numbers by 40%. And we're on track to do that because of our climate smart agricultural programs that are capturing methane and turning it into renewable energy, low carbon transportation fuels, composting, and other additives to the soil. So that's becoming part of taking that nutrient base and putting it back in, but capturing the methane in the process of doing that. And that's, I think you're referring to the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Yes, sorry. The nations yes. had this famous study, Livestock Long Shadow, it was like yes. 18%, it might have been knocked yes. down to 14%. Um, still, Helene York, mm -hmm. do you consider the amount of the uh, Amazon rainforest that's been uh, cleared to grow soy, to feed cows, if you consider land use, uh, there's quite a tremendous impact of, of meat on, on the climate. And if we're in a moment where COVID might be shifting, you know, your thoughts there on whether mm -hmm. The, the beef impact of climate is overstated. You tried to have meat more of a, a, a side dish or a garnish rather than the main, uh, the main mm -hmm. chorus on a plate. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, Karen made several points there. And one of the things that she said, and I'm going to reiterate that is as a world, we have to eat less meat than we are. Do we need cattle? Uh, do we need other ruminant animals? Uh, for nutrients uh, in our soil? Um, and are they more appropriate on certain lands than crops and orchards and other things? Yes, 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 and yes. But um, uh, we just consume too much meat, especially in the United States. And um, there's nothing wrong with incorporating meat as part of your diet. It just shouldn't be nine ounces a day. And, um, and we have built a food system to accommodate that particular form of protein as opposed to plant proteins. And um, I'm looking forward to more of a balance uh, in what we grow um, and in consumer acceptance. Um, and I think um, we are seeing, certainly in the 15 years I've been actively involved in this issue, we have seen a really big shift in interest, particularly, let's say, college-age students. Yes. Um, you know, 15 years ago, they couldn't give a hoot about, first of all, the idea of food system contributing to climate change. What are you talking about? You know, deer in the headlights. But um, now it is very much on the minds of students, and it is m very much on the minds of recent grads and you can see that in many ways. I just hope we get there fast enough. Lisa Held, you've written about school uh, lunch programs. Michelle Obama made a lot of progress getting towards more fruits and vegetables. They've been devastated you know, yeah. as part of uh, this COVID, uh, people not going to school. So talk, talk to us about your reporting on the school lunches and, and how you know that, what that's happening, that ripple through the food system. Absolutely. Um, I just want to add one thing to the meat uh, conversation, which is that, you know, I did a lot of reporting on um, the sort of alternative meat producers. I don't know what else to, to call them um, outside of the, you know, big industrial meat companies. And 
during the pandemic, they were seeing a lot of increased demand because yes. of the meat shortages um, happening at the grocery stores and the slowdowns in processing. And a lot of these producers are producing meat in a way that has a lot of environmental benefits, building some healthy soil, um, building ecosystems. And there's still qu a lot of questions and research on greenhouse gas emissions that needs to be figured out. And, and but I, I do think there are, there's an interesting thread to follow after this is all over, which is these producers really showed a lot of resilience during this time. And um, there's a lot of demand for, for that meat produced in more sustainable ways. Um, it, there's a lot of infrastructure that's missing to get it processed. Um, so, mm -hmm. sorry, I, I just wanted yeah. to add that. Okay. <laughs> um, <Good. Good> <laughs> and, and, um, and on school lunch, yeah, this is huge actually. Um, I, you know, a lot of these, um, school districts just very quickly pivoted to doing um takeout takeout that's seems go. weird when you talk about yeah. school meals <laughs> um, delivery and pickup meals and um and the usda we, we talked earlier they actually they approved a lot of waivers to make it possible for districts to do that very quickly and you know 23 million students in this country depend on free and reduced yes. price lunches so you know those were a lot of students that districts were, were making sure that they, they had food. The, the big problem is that they're not able to um, reach as nearly as many students, even if they're, they're working around the clock. So, you know, one school I, I talked to and uh, met the Metro Nashville Public Schools at when they were doing the, the highest number of meals, they're producing about 10,000 a day, which sounds like a lot and it is, but on a normal school day, they produce 82,000 meals. So um, the meal programs are one of the biggest uh, sources of revenue is reimbursements from the federal government and it's per meal. So they just are seeing this massive, massive decline in revenue and their costs have stayed the same because they're trying to keep staff on or went up because they're trying to um, get PPE for their employees, uh, you know, hire drivers. They, there's a lot of extra labor. And so they're really struggling financially. Um, and one of the things that this whole situation has revived is this cool, uh, this call from advo advocacy groups for universal school meals. Um, because we're now that we're in the summer and are starting the next uh, school year, there's going to be this process of essentially determining which students are eligible, eligible for free and reduced price meals. And that is a huge, yeah. huge challenge yeah. for districts and making them do that at a time when um, they are struggling so much financially and it's still a, we're still in a pandemic. Uh, a lot of groups say that that's just, it's just not possible. And a lot of uh, school nutrition directors I've talked to have talked about the challenges. Um, so actually um, there was a bill that was just introduced this morning. Um, mm -hmm. The House Democrats introduced a bill for universal school meals for next year that would essentially take that burden off of the schools. Uh, it's unlikely to go anywhere, but um, it's introduced. Helene <laughs> York? Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to realize that the US school lunch program is the biggest hunger relief program mm -hmm. in the country. I mean, whether it's 23 million or 30 million, I've seen some numbers, but, um, it, you know, we are five, whatever, depending on your perspective, four months, six months into this pandemic uh, in the United States. And um, we're likely to have this go on for another 12 or more months. Hunger is going to become right. a real issue. It is now, it is going to grow and likely having children get food from the uh, school lunch program could be the biggest thing we do uh, to prevent horrific poverty and hunger uh, in this country. Just joining us, we're talking with Lisa Held, the senior reporter with Civil Eats, Karen Ross, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and Helene York, a professor at the Food and Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. We have a question from Ann Chadwick via YouTube. Can we use this crisis to rebuild in a more climate smart way? Karen Ross, I know that uh, from people in, in uh, Governor Newsom's office, they're really concerned that this uh, coronavirus is, is pushing aside all other priorities yeah. that 
all hands on deck for the virus. So this question, can we use the crisis to rebuild in a more climate smart way? Well, now that we're working 28 hours a day on COVID, we do have time. <laughs> I mean, that's what it feels like some days. But we have not lost our, our focus on climate. Obviously, um, the decline in funds from the cap and trade auction will have an impact on a lot of our incentive programs. And so we're already meeting with financial wizards and many others to really think through how else do we continue the momentum that we have. Here in California, we use cap and trade auction proceeds to fund our climate smart agricultural programs. Over $600 million in the last five years have been invested in helping transition agriculture to part of our carbon neutrality goal. And we've done that throughout the economy. How do we sustain that momentum? Where do we leverage federal partnerships? Where are we creating new partnerships, especially in the marketplace, where buyers are now thinking in a more holistic, sustainable way? What's my long-term sourcing, regardless of whether I'm buying it here in the United States or overseas? Really understanding that and helping to put more emphasis into things like healthy soils, our water footprint, how we're using nitrogen fertilizers, um, how we're helping to generate renewable energy, um, the, the food processing energy efficiency programs that we've funded the last couple of years. Um, and so shame on us if we don't have two things at the center of economic recovery that will both make us better than we were. One is equity because the spotlight on essential workers and the pockets of poverty throughout the country that are just being exacerbated in the spotlight, um, and part because of the, of the focus on racism and systemic racism that's now happening while we are also at home with COVID, and two, with a climate lens. How do we invest in economic recovery and think about climate, which is tied to health, which is tied to equity, um, so that wherever the investments happen, wherever recovery dollars happen, wherever stimulus dollars happen, we're all thinking in a very integrated, holistic way around rebuilding and rebuilding better. And I believe agriculture and our food systems have to be a part of leading that, ag in particular, because we're already feeling the effects of climate change. If we really care about food security, with a growing population, we have to be leading the charge on climate change, climate smart agriculture, investing in healthy soils, and sequestration on our farms and forests to help solve this urgent, urgent problem. Lisa Hill, there's been a lot of reconsideration uh, because of coronavirus of globalization, the idea of bringing supply chains, you know, reconsidering globalization, reconsidering uh, population density, you know, the density of cities, all these things are being reconsidered. Uh, we have a food supply system that's built on these long supply chains, <laughs> centralization and cheap fossil fuels. So your thoughts on how some of that might be reconsidered um, in a post COVID world. Yeah, I think, Based on the reporting I've done, I would say that it does seem like there is there are some insights that are coming out of this that show us that local and regional systems um, have some resilience that could be really helpful in the climate crisis. And you know, some of these things we've already talked about, for instance, you know, small farms that are diversified when it comes when there's a crisis and they need to pivot, it can be easier to do that if you have, you know. 1200 acres of onions, that's really hard to find another market for that. But if you have a diversified farm and you can, it's, it's 10 acres and you can say, okay, well, I'll just call up these people and I'll try to sell this here and that there, you know, there, there's some resilience that um, in diversification, both from an ecosystem perspective and then also a financial perspective. Um, and I think, you know, I think our food system our global food system is really built on efficiency. And I think this came up a couple of times too. And you know, that, that is great. It's, it's incredibly effective in terms of making food cheap and um, you know, making people money, which everybody wants. <laughs> um, and it's, it's great in, in times of relative stability, but you know, I think what we're beginning to see that is that efficiency in, you know, in meat production, for example, means that, in the name of that fast sheet meat, the system sacrifices certain things like protecting workers. So, you know, we can, during stability, stable times, we can ignore the fact that 
workers aren't paid enough or don't have paid sick leave, um, we, we can, the workers can't, they're living it. But, um, but it means that when, when then the crisis is a pandemic, sick people come to work and it makes the crisis work worse. And I think the parallel for climate is that global system, you know, in meatpacking, it also routinely sacrifices environmental concerns. So, you know, not accounting for the environmental costs associated with the concentration of hogs in consolidated animal feeding operations. We can ignore that most of the time, but then when the crisis is say a hurricane and hog operations are in its path, you know, thousands instead of hundreds of dead pigs are gonna result and those would have been food. When a meatpacking plant shuts down that is processing 25,000 hogs a day, that's a way bigger issue than when a plant shuts down that is maybe processing 500 and you can shift that production to another plant. Um, and, you know, so there's sort of, there, there's, I think we're, we're seeing some of the costs of efficiency in the global system and maybe that, that can lead to a shift towards a little bit more focus on resilience in terms of the climate crisis. And Helene York, one aspect of resilience is just financial uh, sustainability. We're seeing a lot of small uh, restaurants, small businesses basically go away. Maybe they'll get some federal funding as this new round of, of support. Uh, but it's also possible that this could lead to further consolidation. You work for food service companies that are at risk. They might go away if they can't. Uh, they were sort of large, powerful forces, positive forces toward more respect for the environment, sustainability. So talk about how the power dynamics could change in the food system as a result of COVID. Well, I think we're already beginning to see business consolidation accelerate. Um, I mean, this has been going on for 50 years. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, you know, one of the things, whether you consider this good or bad, I'm, I'm mixed about this, um, but a lot of innovative companies are bought by a lot of the big companies uh, to bring uh, either, resilience has not been the goal, but it may be now, um, uh, but to bring new ideas, new markets, uh, new uh, consumers to these mainline companies, the big CPG companies. Um, I, I do, I, I, I'm going to predicate everything by saying that it really depends on how long this lasts because companies will stay in business yeah. if they have the cash to stay in business. Yeah. And you, you hear that over and over and over again. It's all about the cash and how you're using the cash. And unfortunately that leads to a lot of layoffs, but it also leads to, if you manage your money well, you have a higher stock price if you're a public company, you have fewer employees. I mean, it's a bad cycle. Um, but a lot of what I'm seeing is that there is still interest among entrepreneurs and among the many different firms that have started um, investing in food businesses. I mean, it's really been the last 10, 12 years where we've had a lot of these uh, different early stage entrepreneur capital funds. And some of them are very, very creative. And they're using this time to refuel, to rethink, to uh, create better direct to consumer strategies. Um, and they're uh, pivoting to, uh, um, supermarkets um, because uh, as one channel instead of food service. Um, so I think that's all good. But of course, I'm no longer an employee of a really large food service company because I'm a COVID uh, uh, layoff myself. Um, and I do think, though, that, uh, and this gets back to a question that Lisa was responding to before about what can consumers do? I think it's actually really hard to know about the companies and their practices. You can know to some degree, but as Gabriel uh, pointed out in the, in the video, you know, he's representing workers at artisan bread manufacturers, you know, which have this halo of mm. local, sustainable, organic, 
but they're not great necessarily to their employees. Some are brilliant, some are not. How do you know? You can't know that about all of your food. But if you're buying food through a supermarket channel and that supermarket is a public company, then I think you need to use your shareholder activism, put that hat on and really press those companies to, to show that they are buying from companies that are ethical, environmentally responsible, fair, humane, all of the attributes, um, and there are others, certainly climate friendly, um, that we want to promote. Karen Russ, I want to think about climate impact. Certainly uh, <laughs> workers, uh, outdoor workers, uh, are there's increasing heat and they're, they're really at uh, construction workers, farm workers yep. are at, at, uh, at risk of it's just being, I've heard even some crops being uh, picked at night in California because it's mm -hmm. cooler. What are some of the climate risks to our food system? We're talking about COVID. Uh, this someday we'll get a vaccine. This will subside. Climate's right. not going away. Right. Right, right, right. So impacts we've already felt uh, because we're California, so water is always going to be an issue. Not only do you have increased temperatures, and we're already seeing that if you look at year or year averages, but what it's doing to precipitation patterns. Um, so we are going to have wetter, wet years and the potential of devastating floods. Um, we're going to have drier, dry years. Um, and, and so our water system was built for snow happening and staying in the mountains and then melting slowly and filling our reservoir system and moving that way. So really rethinking um, how, we, how we farm with changing temperatures, which has a big impact on a lot of the specialty crops that we do better. And in some cases, the only ones that are growing them in this country, when you think about a lot of our tree fruits, some of our vegetable crops, and especially our tree nut crops, that all of a sudden you've moved the season up. We're not getting the chill hours. There are some crops we're just not growing as much up here because of those very changes already. Then all of a sudden you're getting a crop that's coming in at a time where you're competing with a different set of competitors or whatever that might be. So the complications from just a pure business case are huge. And then you factor into that the animal care and the animal husbandry because of temperatures in particular and you factor in taking care of farm workers and starting the days earlier, taking more breaks, just so everyone knows, and I wanna say this because of OSHA, we have state OSHA that's taking a very different approach than our federal, federal partners do. And California is still the only state in this country that has heat stress prevention programs, and we've had those for more than 10 years. And that was a, that was a matter of behavior change when it first happened, people were like, oh, we can't be, we have to have, we have to have coverings. We have to be able to take more breaks. We have to have water in different positions. We have to make sure that it's cold. And that first couple of years, it was farmers themselves telling their neighbors, hey, you need to have shade cover out here. I'll give you mine and I'll go back and get extra. We can make behavior change happen, but it takes a really focused, consistent messaging effort on that. And we are harvesting things, especially I'm very fond since I was president of California wine grape growers. In the wine grape sector in particular, it was an energy savings. It was a quality savings. It's, you know, making sure you've got the lights to do it safely. But those are the kinds of things that may happen. But you have to think holistically about it's not just about the quality. It's not just about saving energy and cooling costs coming into the plant. You also have to think about very carefully the safety of those workers and their quality of life that will be impacted if we start to do more of those kinds of shifts. So nothing is unconnected. It's all, it's all tied together. <laughs> Sure. And Karen Ross, since you mentioned uh, wine grapes, uh, yes. <laughs> the industry is is moving north to Oregon, yeah. Washington, even into British Columbia. You know, mm -hmm. is that inevitable that California will lose its iconic wine industry, or it will change? Yeah. Because uh, or Washington and Oregon yeah. are very happy. I was in Walla Walla recently. Yes. It's like the little new Napa. Yeah, yeah. So I I started Wine Grape Growers of America and used to go up to Washington State, and I'd be talking to wheat growers who are just starting out with wine grapes going, what is California doing up here? Now they love it that all the big brands want to have a diversified portfolio. And I think this is the, the thinking about varietals and looking always for the best place 
that will express the grape varietals that you want and rethinking our whole breeding programs to make sure we're, we're doing varietals that are suitable for the changing climate that we have. There's some really great innovative researchers and grape growers and winemakers that are doing a lot of effort to understand what that changing temperature means. And more importantly, if we don't have the cooling at nighttime, that's one thing that people don't recognize how important that is to wine flavor, wine quality, and thinking through all the way from what we're planting, because you're planting it for at least 25 years, and you want to make sure you're getting it right and you're looking forward, not in the rear view mirror about this work. This one was always the one that gave us those price wines. We have to be looking forward and looking globally at wine varietals. I think it's exciting. We're introducing some new things that maybe we wouldn't have tasted before because we're locked into the five main varietals. Now we're getting into blends and we're thinking about these things better. So as we wrap up at the end, I want to look forward a little bit. Um, uh, Lisa Held, what are some things that you'd like to see? You know, we've talked about the, the Prime Act, things that the government could do to, to be good for the climate, good for our food system. Uh, this, you know, this, we're opening, uh, entering an election year where the, the realm of political possibility seems to be expanding. Uh, Lisa Held, what are some things that would be good for the climate, good for our food system? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of climate, there are some, there's definitely been some movement in terms of um, people in power talking more about climate. And, you know, the house just released this really big um, pr proposal around, around climate and agriculture is a huge part of it. And I think it's encouraging just to see politicians and elected officials paying attention to these issues. Um, I, I'm not sure how much of, of that proposal will become reality. And um, that kind of remains to be seen at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think things are shifting a little bit. And, and I, I think that the one positive about uh, this, how much COVID-19 has impacted the food system is, it's hard to say positive. It still feels like terrible to say that, but I guess a, a silver lining a little bit is that we're just talking more about how food is produced and what it looks like and who's affected and who's involved and all the factors. And though I think just having those conversations related to COVID are going to lead to more deeper sort of conversations mm -hmm. about the connection between food production and the environment. Yeah, yeah, relationship with food is certainly changing. Yeah. Right. New York, your, your, your last thoughts on how to, you know, have a healthier food system and healthier climate coming out of COVID. Well, the thing that I uh, was most uh, deeply involved in for the past several years was in radically reducing food waste in uh, mm -hmm. production kitchens, in uh, restaurant kitchens. And uh, I... It's Which is a huge contribution to climate change. Yeah. 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 Huge, huge, uh, especially since most of the country doesn't have composting the way <laughs> we do in a lot of uh, the West Coast, but not even all of the West yeah. Coast. Um, uh, but uh, th there's a much greater amount of waste, food waste, that comes out of private homes. And that was true pre-COVID, and mm -hmm. this is it's at least as bad now. 43% yeah. or something of the 63 million tons of food waste that we produce in the United States every year, according to refed, refed.com, I recommend it to yeah. anyone interested in this subject, comes from private homes. And, mm. um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Instagram and all kinds of other social media. It's like, look, I'm making banana bread. I'm making my own uh, bread at home. Well, are you using the whole oven to cook one bread? Um, you know, you're not being efficient um, necessarily in making food. And then how much are you wasting, especially in the early period when everybody was hogging things? Uh, toilet paper lasts a lot longer than most food items. But, uh, you know, it's like we need... We need a uh, national home ec uh, understanding. Um, I didn't have that when I was in school. I'm a little too young for that, but I heard a lot about it. And I, there's so many basics about how to manage um, around a kitchen 
Um, and, uh, you know, not only making food, but keeping your own inventories, buying the appropriate yeah. amount, buying the amount that's appropriate for your consumption. Um, I, I hope that if I mean, this is going to last a little longer, that would be my great hope for the country is that we who are now in charge of those things instead of restaurants, especially in my field, uh, that we really work at that and radically reduce the amount of food overconsumption as well as food waste that is going to landfills. Karen Ross, you were in the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh -huh. coming out of, of the, the Great Recession and have seen yeah. you know, in the position where the, the agricultural uh, system and the economy mm -hmm. comes out of a terrible uh, collapse. Mm -hmm. your, your thoughts on this this time around? Well, um, that led to a lot of consolidation, and this one will lead to a lot of consolidation. Um, and that's just a, a sad fact of life. Um, as much as we want many, many, many small farmers, it's hard work, it's capital intensive. And when markets get disrupted, if you're not able to pivot, it's hard to have the capital to keep going. That's one of the things that I worry about on the farmer side. And that doesn't even count the mental health issues. Farming is a somewhat solitary business. You're outside, you're outdoors. Um, you like being somewhat independent and you want to be the strong image of what a farmer working the land is. And the mental health issues and the stress, and you add disrupted markets, uh, commodity prices that aren't paying for your cost of production, am I even going to break even this year? And then you have a workforce that you don't have a business if you don't have a healthy workforce, and there's costs. We've already talked about some of the adaptations that have to happen. So I worry about what that does um, to, family, to family life going forward. Um, but I do want to say if there's one economic stimulus, that's one of the most important ones. It's SNAP benefits and increasing SNAP benefits. That is economic stimulus in the local economy. That's helping people. You know, I'd love for them to eat healthier with those SNAP dollars that they have. But that is the one thing that helps farmers and it helps people who, uh, no fault of their own, may be unemployed for a while. It's, it's self-regulating as people go back to work. They don't need those SNAP benefits. Not paying attention to what Congress is or is not doing to make sure people can buy food for themselves and their families, especially our vulnerable populations, is something that we all should really wake up and make sure our voices are heard on that. Yeah, thank you for mentioning SNAP. would be a malpractice if we didn't... Uh... <laughs> Mentioned, mentioned, got through all of this without mentioning that. I'd like to give a shout out to the Climate One team making this happen virtually as they were the brains and muscles behind this. And on Climate One today, we've been talking about the impact of coronavirus on America's food and agriculture. We've learned about the effect on low wage and vulnerable workers, the disruption of meat markets, the trends toward further consolidation of wealth and power and other implications. I'm Greg Dalton, and my guests were Lisa Held, Senior Reporter for Civil Eats, Karen Ross, Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and Helene York, Professor at the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us give more people talking about climate, food, and energy, and water, and all these good things by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the conversation. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you next time, everybody. Thanks to our fabulous panel, our all-stars today. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy, and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat, so you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. 
Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50 percent. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website, commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again. Consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe.